Hi, my name's Pete Knapp, an Air Quality PhD student at Imperial College London. This series of podcasts is kindly promoted by the Grantham Institute, the college's hub for climate change and environment. Subscribe to receive future episodes and contact the Grantham Institute on Twitter with at Grantham underscore IC and me with at Pete K underscore AQ. This is Tipping Points, a podcast featuring interviews with people who have become environmental activists. What made them change? What are they doing now? And what do they hope to see in the future as we face possible breakdown of civilization and life on Earth? This first series focuses on scientists in the UK. With me in this episode is Dr. Tristram Wyatt from London. Welcome. Afternoon. Now, I always start these podcasts with a life story in three minutes. If you're happy, go ahead with your three minutes of your life story. So I was always interested in animal behaviour. And according to my parents, my first word was zoo. I was lucky enough to do zoology at Cambridge. While I was on a field course in my final year, I saw some very bright, shiny beetles. So this is an air breathing beetle with the tide coming in twice a day. I discovered that nobody had worked on it for about 30 years. That became my PhD. When I'd finished that, I discovered there were very few jobs in parental care in beetles. And it was then that I was lured into the world of pheromones. I moved to Cardiff to study uh, moth and beetle pheromones. They're important pests. They also just have these amazing pheromones, which are these invisible chemical signals, many of which we can't smell, but some we can. And they use them to communicate all sorts of things, whether it's alarm or sex, or uh, in the case of rabbits, um, where to find a nipple. A few years later, I found myself at the University of Oxford. And in 2008, I retired. And I keep an association with zoology in Oxford And more recently, I have an attachment as a visiting lecturer at uh, University College London in the Centre for Biodiversity and Ecological Research. That's what brings me to now. I'm in the very lucky position of being able to choose what to do. I've been writing. um, The thing that's actually given me most pleasure and given me most influence is writing a book about pheromones across the animal kingdom. Now, I said I worked on moths and beetles. But when I was approached by Cambridge University Press uh, to write something about pheromones, they wanted a book that covered the whole animal kingdom. And that was a challenge because I'm most confident talking and writing about things that I really know about. Reading about fish, mice, bears, dogs, cats, humans turned out to be fascinating and also revealed all sorts of patterns. It's time for the third edition. A normal way of things, I would be halfway through the revisions because the world moves very quickly in this area of science. I'm putting it on hold because with the crisis in biodiversity, it really doesn't seem that important. What I'm trying to decide at the moment is how best to put my efforts into those activities, uh, particularly with Extinction Rebellion. I'm sure a lot of people can empathize with that because in science, especially when you're siloed in certain areas and then you become awakened to this craziness that is the climate and ecological crisis that you might think when you go go back to work, actually, this isn't what I need to do. You say that you're in a position now where you can easily make that change, but presumably younger scientists may not feel, especially people doing their PhDs as I am. Like if they wanted to change their path, it's much more difficult. What kind of words of advice would you give people in that situation? Well, I would keep on going with what you've started, because there are certain milestones. <laughs> Even if you want to change fields, um, you're in a different position if you have your PhD. You've um, shown that accomplishment. Uh, if you've published some papers, you've shown that you can uh, contribute to the literature. And that puts you in a very different position if you want to continue um, either in academic or industry science. So my recommendation would be to continue with that. I can imagine that in the geosciences, where so much of the funding is actually related to the fossil fuel industry, 
and that's probably true for the research councils too, it's going to be much harder because there simply isn't the funding to do the work that we need doing. And those scientists that have managed it, I think, are to be um, highly admired. Bill McGuire at UCL, he's written an open letter basically saying to his fellow scientists in his field, now is the time to step out and actually join a movement to do science that is crucially relevant and urgent. And that the time for going to conferences and talking about things we've always talked about and doing the things that we've always done, however successful our careers over the last 40 years, now is a time to change. And I think what we need in every area of science is people doing that. Do you think that there should be a mass movement of scientists moving into fields that help to avert the climate crisis? I do. Given the timescales that are involved, what's emerged even this summer, it really does look as though it's make or break. And people are starting to use code red as an indicator of the urgency. But once leaders start using those words, it's then possible to challenge them about their actions, because then you can say there's a mismatch. And one of the very pleasing things is the way that David Attenborough in recent years has become much more outspoken. Mm. But one of the frustrations for many conservation scientists over the years is how little he said back in the day. So we've had 40 years of the most wonderful natural history programmes, and I've used them in my teaching throughout that period. The, the animal behaviour is wonderful and captured on film in ways that nobody else has managed. He's got an amazing team of camera people, but also the scientists who actually did the work that allowed that filming. But when it came to environmental destruction, the cameras were always trained to avoid the smokestacks and the pollution and the vanishing species until very recently. And do you think the reason for that was because they, they, they thought, well, if we want to get the, the public on side in terms of protecting nature, we're going to present nature in a really beautiful way such that the public think, well, that's amazing, I'd love to keep it. Or did, do you think that maybe they were doing it for um, just to make good telly? I think it's a bit of both. I mean, the pristine environment is very attractive. I think it's actually more insidious. If you listen to George Monbiot recently on Double Down News, where he's spoken very candidly about the reaction of producers and controllers at the BBC, they have ruled out any programme that covered environmental destruction. And they were highly dismissive of any programme proposal that included those elements. So pretty, pretty nature programmes bring in the viewers and don't depress anybody, as well as being glorious television. But there has been a fully conscious editorial position by successive producers and controllers to stop that message coming out. Hmm. What, what was your path towards becoming a member of XR? A friend of mine uh, was involved from close to the beginning. He was there sitting down in the road outside Parliament in Parliament Square. I was um, standing on the pavement, not very courageous. But when the police asked the XR demonstrators on this first demonstration, lots of people did start to get up. And Donica said, well, wait a minute, aren't we here to be arrested? And it was only later, um, I guess the following summer, that I started to get a bit more involved. But I've been fairly reticent. I did see the scientists wearing their white lab coats. And I think that's actually really powerful. It is symbolic. And most of us actually work on a keyboard. <laughs> we don't really work in a lab. And then in the last actions, my husband is not keen on me getting arrested. With the changes in police tactics, it's sometimes been hard to um, guarantee to him that it's not going to happen. But something I did start doing this last set of actions is getting involved with the arrestee support. So I've been helping at a local police station, making sure that there are always people there to look after the um, XR arrestees when they um, are finally released, perhaps at four in the morning. 
yeah it's, it's, it's that's definitely one of the things that i remember uh feeling when i came out of the police station seeing seeing someone waiting there for me the world isn't that crazy you know there's someone here who actually um is is going to help me get back into society after <laughs> being in that cell for 11 hours what do you think is the the main purpose of scientists for xr i think the first is to demonstrate to other scientists that credible scientists are part of extinction rebellion we're going to need lots of scientists to have an influence within their learned societies and ultimately changing government policy if you're going to get it to snowball um, it needs to start with some and we need to be very visible and i think one of the tasks for the coming year is to become much more visible and vocal with our colleagues and within our own scientific organizations another is for the general public we do have credibility justifiably and within extinction rebellion itself i know that it's very important that there are scientists involved as sounding boards so i think it's vital that extinction rebellion is informed by the science do you think that's the case though within all of xr because um uh, some XR messaging uh, may not have the citation and, and may be misinterpreted even. That is one of the tensions. It has been able to react surprisingly quickly to changing situations. But it sometimes means that getting feedback where a scientist might want to mull over a word or a paragraph or even a sentence for a couple of hours or even overnight. Those are the timescales for a journal those are not the timescales for a press release. And I think that is one of the tensions, that people who work in the media on those timescales are aware how quickly you have to respond. Um, and I think as scientists, we actually do find it hard, especially when we want to be sure of our sources. I wonder how you feel about referring to yourself as a member or a, a affiliated in some way with Extinction Rebellion, especially among academic peers, I'm sure it's in the back of all our minds. And I have put it in my Twitter bio. In a way, um, it's a little bit like coming out. One of my weirdest moments was um, giving a talk at the University of Toronto. I was introduced as the scientist I am, but also as the founder of the lesbian and gay support group at the University of Oxford. Um, actually, that was quite a nice way to be introduced, uh, along with the science. And I think we're at that stage with Extinction Rebellion, which is close to where we were a long time ago with LGBT rights. The only way that it will change is if more of us start to put it into our email signatures, um, put it into our biographies. Somebody I know at York, professor in chemistry, had a battle with every conference where he wanted to put in his biography what his husband did in the way that sometimes straight colleagues did and mentioning their child. And he just kept on putting it in there. And I think that's what we need to do with Extinction Rebellion. We're not at a tipping point yet in involvement with scientists, but I think we're at a stage where the more of us who do, uh, the more likely we are to persuade others to join us. What has impressed me hugely um, since... Extinction Rebellion started in 2018, is how effective it's been. So if we go back into prehistory, as a student, I was the chair of Friends of the Earth at the University of Cambridge. What's slightly depressing is all the things that we were fighting for back in 1976 um, are the things we're still fighting for now. We were lobbying, we were getting change in the university, but we really didn't change that much. I've continued to support Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth. But what really got things moving was the direct action which Extinction Rebellion started. Do you feel that XR's message might be too broad in the way that Insulate Britain's message might be, let's say, more capable of uh, completing its goal? I think the Insulate Britain's um, demands are precise, very achievable. The first is you make people warmer. The second is that you provide a great deal of employment 
because this needs lots of hands to um, fit that insulation, to retrofit it. And third, you reduce greenhouse emissions. In every way, it's a win. Even though they're separate from Extinction Rebellion, the Insulate Britain's demands are completely consistent. Um, these all go in the right direction and it all keeps climate change on the agenda. All of those things are to the good. There was the Chatham House report that came out this week that said that the likelihood of our current pledged trajectories being under one and a half degrees is uh, under one percent and the likelihood of being under two degrees is under five percent. Now I just wonder what kinds of changes need to be made. I think it's one of the surprising things that's being revealed, the extraordinary subsidies and misapplied funding for agriculture. Now one of the ironies is that a Britain no longer part of um, the common agricultural policy could change very rapidly to remove the subsidies. There is no argument, I think, good argument for continuing to do those. But these are big societal changes. I think that's where Extinction Rebellion is very good at highlighting the subsidies that we've simply not really thought about. They've been hidden. I wonder about your involvement with XR as a gay man. Do you think that XR has been welcoming to people of different sexualities? And why do you think it might not be quite so welcoming to other groups? As far as sexuality is concerned, there's an LGBT subgroup for us. And I am a member of that. Um, and it's very active on Facebook. And in fact, I felt my affinity much more with XR Lambeth and with XR scientists. So that's been where I've tended to go. What was very pleasing was in the actions this August, there were many people of colour as spokespeople. I think there's a recognition that XR has to represent a wide membership. Now, in terms of demonstrations, it has been disproportionately white, and it doesn't reflect the ethnic diversity of London. Now, you could argue it's sometimes called white privilege. It's also class privilege. That the consequences for being arrested, that our experience is going to be different from a person of colour, both in the way that we're treated by the police and by the lifetime consequences of a criminal record and so forth. What we do need is an emphasis by XR, and I think it's coming, on the many different ways that people can get involved. So there are so many ways that people can get involved without being arrested. There are so many ways by keyboard, supporting others who are getting arrested. And we have to make sure that we are as represented by as diverse a range of people as possible. Yeah, there's also the group um, XR Unify, which... Uh... Ah, yes, in fact, yes, who were doing the big march on Finsbury Park on the same uh, day that Sunday that we were doing the demonstration outside the science museum. Yes, I think in fact, they would be as it were even more important within Britain than the International and Global South organization within XR. You, you, you mentioned earlier that you're kind of bound by your husband in terms of being arrested. Uh, if it was your call entirely, presumably things would be a little different. I think I'm probably using him as an excuse. <laughs> So it is, certainly, it is certainly the case that whenever I go on a demonstration, he is encouraging me not to get arrested. He's black and that may have some influence. He's also trained as a barrister. I guess I'm scared and I'm in awe of all the people who have gone that extra step, like yourself and, and Caroline and so many others. I guess going through that door of not having ever been arrested and then suddenly having been. How important is it then that activists put themselves on the wrong side of the law? It is only through the arrests that we have had the news coverage and other organisations such as Insulate Britain. And you've had you know, the bizarre thing just as when I was being interviewed by local radio. And it's been the similar thing on Newsnight uh, with Claire O'Farrell being interviewed 
it was only because of the actions of Extinction Rebellion that Claire O'Farrell, as a spokesperson, was being interviewed and given lots mm. of time for the first time on Newsnight in a very effective way. It's a bit like the courage taken by whistleblowers with the Pentagon Papers leaking what the US government was doing in Vietnam. And then more recently, Julian Assange as a publisher with WikiLeaks and Snowden getting that information to WikiLeaks. It, it does take extraordinary courage and the risk of arrest and possibly long imprisonment that has given those world-changing events. It's a dilemma. And I think with our particular Home Secretary and with the police bill, that's the other problem. Campaigning against the government bills is impossible when the news is managed. And with the acquiescence, I'm afraid, of the BBC, very little news time or analysis is given to these potentially life-changing bills. When the police bill goes through and becomes law, the kinds of protests that Extinction Rebellion has been carrying out will simply be illegal. Even the beginnings of an action which has the potential to cause anxiety or discomfort at the discretion of a police officer becomes an arrestable offence. We actually end up with no protests being possible. Liberty, of course, has been pointing this out, Extinction Rebellion, Black Lives Matter, in common cause with all their stop the bill actions. We're in a very dangerous place. What that may mean is the only action will be arrestable, but actually it will also be illegal. Whereas previously, many people were released without charge. I don't know where it leaves us because the urgency that we've been discussing gets greater by the day, but our means of potential action are being constrained precisely because the actions have been so effective to date. What's your opinion on the role of the police? It's highly politicised. Now, I think that really has been the revelation to nice middle-class white folk. Whether you've been watching the Steve McQueen series or thinking back to the minor strike, and I was one of those who didn't see the significance of Orgreave at the time, the police have always been politicised. And that is true when you go back to the way that the military were used in at Peterloo um, back in the 19th century. I think we're just now much more aware, it's become more stark, at how political the police are in the way that which actions they police in a heavy handed way. The change in tactics is scary. Um, and I think it's designed to be. I think the intimidation and the change in tactics is an attempt to make doing any kind of demonstration a more daunting prospect. And that's, that's their aim, an intimidation before the event. Uh, and similarly, arresting people ahead of time. Police are now being used in ways that they weren't in the first wave of occupations in 2019. It's going to be very interesting to see how um, XR changes its campaigning. Something I thought was really good with this set of demonstrations was the idea of the pink tables and climate conversations. And I think that's a brilliant idea. And I think it may be you need to make it so that you can do this everywhere. Every town above a certain size has a bank and a boots. And those were the target of actions that everybody could join. They were very local, very low key, but they involved community activists. And I think it was called Uncut. So the Uncut grassroots organization allowed people wherever they were without traveling to have an action locally. And something that I was hearing in Malvern, they were putting out a table every Saturday and talking to people and handing out leaflets. And that's how people have done things. And it may be how we'll have to do things again. But as you say, it's those kinds of actions that, that didn't really make very much traction yeah. in the first place, right? Yeah. So perhaps it has to be 
some noteworthy actions, but it's going to take um, people with enormous courage. And creativity. But then uh, XR has got a lot of both of those two things. Yes. And I think that really has been, along with the beautiful messaging, the creativity has been such an, such a strength of the organisation. Why do you think that, that COVID might have made people lose their sense of smell, either temporarily or, or permanently? The exact cause is not yet known. And it does look as though the virus enters the body through either the neurons themselves in the nose, the ones that do the smelling, but possibly also the support cells. And so the reason the sense of smell is lost temporarily is that either the support cells or the sensory neurons themselves are killed or otherwise affected. Shortly after the pandemic spread, scientists and doctors found that lots of patients were coming to them saying that they had lost their sense of smell and that this was associated with COVID infection. And so an international consortium got going, and I'm now part of the management team of that. People have been doing kitchen studies. Can they smell lemon? Can they taste sugar, salt? Trying to distinguish what we colloquially call taste, which is really smell, from what is real taste, which is on the tongue. One of the distressing things is that sometimes when smell returns, it is not good. So people report smelling bad smells, just a nastiness of poo or all sorts of weird smells and things that were previously very attractive. It's almost as if the nerve cells haven't connected to the right place in the olfactory bulb. Other people report that their sense of smell does return uh, after a few weeks. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, do you think that uh, spray uh, fertilizers or herbicides um, affect the behavior of insects that use pheromones, uh, such as honeybees? Probably not so directly. There are strong suggestions that uh, the neonicotinoid insecticides do have effects. Pheromones are one of the big success stories in green pest control. So the apples you eat and the tomatoes you buy in the supermarket have probably been grown with the help of pheromones. So in greenhouses, the tomatoes are pollinated by bumblebees. And if you have bumblebees doing the pollination, if you have a pest moth, you can't use an insecticide because that would kill the bumblebees. So what you use to control the moth is a specific pheromone for that moth which so confuses the males that they can't find the females. So they don't lay eggs or don't lay fertilized eggs. And um, without the eggs, you don't get any caterpillars. And it's the same story in apple orchards where the codling moth is resistant to the pesticides, but you confuse the male moths by saturating the orchard with a tiny quantity of the female pheromone. And that's enough to specifically prevent the male moths finding their females. Might that have knock-on effects, though? I mean, disturbing the ecosystem in that way? No. Unlike an insecticide, which tends to be broad-spectrum, so it kills moths of every species, and spiders, and predators of other kinds, the beetles and the sucking bugs, using the pheromone brings down that particular species of moth, but it leaves all the predators in place. The spiders and the predatory beetles and sucking bugs can get to work to eat the caterpillars of those and other moths. The only reason there were lots of coddling moths is because you'd artificially increased the density of apple trees. And what you're doing is bringing those down to a low level. It never eliminates the coddling moths. And that's never the aim. What you're trying to do with the pheromone release is bring the number of codling moths below the economic damage threshold. So, that, I mean, that sounds like a, an ideal solution to what we call pests. Do you think that pheromones are used, or that they are used broadly, or do you think that they should be used more broadly in the, in a, in the sense that maybe pesticides might disappear? In Italy, for example, pheromones are now the treatment of choice 
uh, for tackling the moths that um, damage the vines, some of the great moths. Um, pesticide usage has dropped dramatically. And with that, Dr. Tristram Wyatt, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Music from Climate by Eric Ian Walker. Commissioned by the Climate Music Project, we communicate the sense of urgency of the climate and ecological crises through the emotional power of music. More to be found at ericianwalker.bandcamp.com and climatemusic.org.